Hi everyone, Wonia here, and I'm so excited that they've finally been showing a lot of my trapping on season six of Alone because I've been really excited to make some trapping videos and share with you guys the procedures that I used for my traps out there. It was a lot of work and a very dynamic process and I was constantly learning so much so much of the time and I tell you what there's no better way to learn than when your life depends on it. So I want to share with you the techniques that I developed and some of the knowledge that I have around traps but I'm not advocating that you go out and practice this. It's going to be illegal in a lot of places and not necessarily ethical if you don't know that you can do it humanely and being sure that you're actually only going to get your target animal. You can't do it in areas where you might be getting domestic animals for example or the wrong critter in your trap um, and the type that I'm going to be doing are kill traps. They're for sure about killing whatever gets in there. When you're trapping in other areas, more ethical is using releases that don't necessarily kill the animals so that you can let them go if you get the wrong thing. However, then you're basically torturing the animal long term. And we've all heard about, you know, critters chewing off their own foot or injuring themselves to trying to get out of traps. So again, I'm not advocating that you practice these things at home. I'm sharing my experience with you. But I wanna start with a caveat, which is that I do not consider myself an expert trapper by any means. I went out there with very little hands-on actual experience trapping. So the rabbits in particular were most likely to get in my traps in the evening hours. So that made them a really good thing to be trapping so that I could be passively catching food while I was in my shelter, warm by my fire, or sleeping. Another thing is that most critters, especially prey critters, feel a lot more comfortable in the woods than they do in open areas edge habitat, right where open area meets the woods, tend to be the most rich in game. And you're better off setting snares slightly inside the forested areas because when critters are leaving the forested areas, they're gonna be really, really cautious, right? Because that's when they're gonna be most visible to predators. I would always choose to set my traps just inside of a forested area, occasionally in open areas if that was where I had the saplings to do them or if they're very clear trails. But I would try in that case to set them around areas that kind of had natural obstructions, rock piles or bushy areas or something to just break up the habitat so the animals felt more comfortable and less wary. So Early on, the main mechanism that I was using was spring pole snares. So finding a sapling that I could bend over that would be under tension and a kind of noose that when sprung would then release the tension and lift the animal up and off of its feet and sometimes into the air, as you saw with both a rabbit and a squirrel, which incidentally were both in the same trap. So a key part of setting traps well is setting them on good locations. So one of the things that you're of course looking for is a well-used trail. Now this of course is a little bit larger than a rabbit trail. This is more like a deer and a human trail. However, we're gonna pretend in this circumstance that it's a rabbit trail because that's what I'm demonstrating, rabbit trapping. Okay, so here are the two uprights and the cross piece that I have. Now I might have to adjust the cross piece depending on the width of the trail here. And the soil is pretty, pretty firm. And I wanna make sure that it's firm enough to hold my stakes with the amount of tension I'm gonna have from a sapling. So I picked this place because it has a nice sapling. However, it's kind of in the open, so it's not actually an ideal location, which is a great illustration of the fact that it's really rare for you to have a place that has the right sapling and the ideal location in terms of a well-used trail that is gonna be somewhere brushed in and near natural obstacles and, you know, brush and whatnot so that the rabbit is going to not have the trap jump out of the landscape at them. What I would do is I would work on traps pieces like this at night by my fire and then I would have a whole bundle of different 
uprights and cross pieces of different heights and distances. So then when I was out using the very precious few daylight hours for trapping, I could just pull those out and be ready to go rather than having to carve them to each spot. That would have taken up far more time and I was already using all of my daylight hours with trapping. So this looks good. Get that set so that it's right in my divots. And then often you have to kind of fuss with the angle. All right, so now under a little bit of tension, that is holding nicely. So now let's see if that is the amount of tension that this tree can provide and will be just enough to hold this up and enough to pull a rabbit off of its feet, but not so much to pull my stakes up and out of the ground. Again, constant issue with trapping. Okay. So here is my lovely young sapling and I'm going to get this just overhead. And again, I was using a lark's head knot for an awful lot of my trapping. That's what I was doing both on my cross piece and on my tree. And then I'm going to gently release the tree and see if it holds. And hooray! All right, looks good. So I've got my bent sapling. Let's uh, pan overhead here so you can see the sapling bent down and holding nicely to my cross pieces here. Now, of course, I need to put the noose on there. This whole mechanism is no good without a noose. So I like using the Leatherman scissors for this part as opposed to my knife because this is such a delicate mechanism at this point, highly weighted so that just the force of a rabbit or a squirrel can spring it. And that would be so little that my knife could potentially pull it. So I have to be very careful from this point on and I'm going to thread my loop through the cord so that it's attached both to the stick and the paracord. I learned that the hard way when one of my sticks got broken at some point. So even if the stick breaks, the paracord will be enough to pull the noose taut. When I first started, I had the paracord and the the paracord attached to the stick and the noose attached to just the stick, but not the paracord as well. So then I'm going to be measuring. I want this in the middle of the trail in the middle of my set. And I want this fist high off the ground for a rabbit set. So a rabbit fist high off the ground and a fist high loop for a squirrel, three inches off the ground and a three inch loop. So let's measure this. I'll give myself a little extra to work with. And then my mechanism is just an overhand knot. So I do two overhand knots, one in the end. So the knot is made with the, the loose end of my line. And then I go another couple inches and I do one more overhand knot. So the two overhand knots do two things for me. One, it gives me added assurance. Here comes a friend, the mighty predator. Your butt is to the camera, Silas, just to the side. Thank you. Yes, I know. Silas. Don't you go nosing around here. So this is why, friends, you cannot be setting snares in urban areas because the chances of a critter like this one being curious, you know, they're decent. As I was saying before I was so sweetly interrupted by the community cat, um, a two overhand loops does two things. One is it means that the rabbit is not going to be able to pull out the knots. Maybe it could bust one, it's not gonna be able to bust two. And then the additional knot gives me a little bit of a length 
on this loop where there are, and I always save every piece of plastic because I don't want to leave plastic in the environment. So it gives me one stiffer spot. So it holds my noose a little bit more open. Not very open because it's fishing line and it just doesn't have that much stiffness on its own. So here again is where the superpower comes in of my hairs. So I have both white and brown hairs to choose from. So when I have a brown background, then a brown hair is lovely. And uh, in a snowy background, the white ones are the way to go. So it is tricky enough to tie fine knots with little pieces of hair in the best of times. But imagine crouching in the snow in sub-zero temperatures with only a few hours of daylight and without having eaten well in many weeks. And I'm sure you can imagine how tricky the snaring was. I would tie my loop to each side with a piece of hair and then to the ground as well. I would tie to a stick and then bury the stick so that it's held exactly in the middle of the trail in three different places. So the beauty of the hairs is that they are both strong enough to hold this rigid in the middle of the trail and weak enough that the weight of a rabbit or a squirrel can easily break them. So the rabbit comes through here. It puts some tension here, which moves this stick. The tree springs up, the noose pulls tight, and the rabbit is held up off of its feet in the air, waiting for me to come and get it when I check my trap line in the morning. You saw this sight of a stick hanging in the air, only on a loan, they showed it with a squirrel and a rabbit dangling from it. So that is how I would find my game in the morning.